Hi, I'm Melissa Cody. The fastest way to achieve success is to find someone who's already done an amazing job at what you want to do and then have them explain to you exactly what they did to get there. We all rise by lifting others. Hi, I'm Nikki Carter, and we are the founders and owners of Inspirize, a platform where we can connect wildly successful people with aspiring successful people. And over the next 30 minutes, you are going to hear from someone who is truly inspiring. Hello, hello, Nikki Carter here. I am the owner of Next Level PR and the co-owner of Enterprise. We are here with a super fun guest. His name is Daniel. He's from across the pond, now living in Vegas. Cannot wait to get into his story. But first, let's jump over and say hello to Melissa, and then we will get right into it, like always. Thanks, Nikki. Hello. Hello. I'm Melissa Cody. I have my company, Bliss on the Rise, and then I am also the other co-founder of Enterprise and... We have a guest here who also is a business owner, and we want to talk to him about how he started his business and uh, how you can turn hobbies into businesses and all of the things. So, Daniel, introduce yourself, say hello, and let's get into it. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Daniel Ettridge, and I'm, I have my own business as a, as a plumber, <laughs> Ettridge Plumbing, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just ready for the questions that you guys are going to ask. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, Daniel, let's start with where you're from and kind of how you got into your business here in the States and what that looked like, like how it started, how you got here, all those kinds of things. We'll start there and then we'll move forward. Okay. Um, Well, originally from East London, a place called Stratford, and uh, that's where I grew up as a child. And then when I reached the teenage, I moved into a place called Essex and I was there until I was uh, 24. Come to America a couple of times before I actually made the move. Um, I actually met somebody when I was here and ended up staying. But cut long story short, (laughs) I'm still here. So that's really the start of me being in America. And... um, It was a struggle for sure because, you know, you feel homesick. And I honestly felt homesick for about four years until I really started settling in over here and America actually feeling like home. Mm -hmm. And now, like, being here 11 years later, like, when I look back at England, that's no longer home. It's my Um, roots, but it's not home. Yeah. mm, Yeah. Love it. Huh? I said, love it. Yeah. So backstory, and then we'll get into kind of like how you started in your business. Um, My husband is from England, for those of you that don't know. And I feel like he, if he introduced himself, would have a similar story, right? He was like, my mom is still in England. My mom is still in England, his aunts, his uncles, his grandparents, all those things. But after coming here and getting settled, um, I feel like he probably feels like the States are more of a home situation. So what did that kind of four year build up look like in order to get settled, to meet people? Like, what did you do? What did it look like mindset wise to want to stay here? Like what kind of things did you have to do in order to really like decide to stay? Well, for me, it was a fresh start because back in England, uh, growing up as a child, like we had a really terrible childhood. So, you know, throughout my life, um, I had quite a a negative outlook on England and I felt kind of trapped. So mm. when I first came to America, initially in 2008, I just fell in love with the place. It was brand new. It was a fresh start. I didn't know anybody. So when I made the initial move, when I lived here permanently, was in 2010. And obviously, you know, then you start facing challenges because you, it's a brand new country. The whole system's completely different to what it is back in England. And you've got to figure all this out and it's not easy. And, you know, when you've got a partner that you think is going to support you and they don't, and they actually tell you to your face, you're alone. It's like, wow. Mm. <laughs> so I, did have, I didn't have any support. I had to figure out everything on my own. And for people that never really moved to another country or experienced of, had the experience of living in a foreign land, it's a challenge. 
for sure. So it takes extra effort and work to achieve the smaller things in life. And obviously, as they become greater, um, it becomes more of a challenge because now it's like you have to learn how, well, you have to learn the American way, which is all foreign, obviously. So let me talk about one of the first times I went to England. I was jet lagged as all hell. My father-in-law was driving in uh, in a roundabout because in England, there's like a million of them compared to here. There's not that many roundabouts here, especially on the West Coast. And you are half asleep, super jet lagged. You're driving the opposite way on the road. You're on the wrong side of the road, on the wrong side of the car, going the wrong direction in a roundabout. And in that moment, I felt so overwhelmed, but even just saying it, like, it doesn't sound that overwhelming. I wasn't even driving. I'm sitting in like the back seat watching someone go the wrong. I couldn't imagine driving and learning to like drive in, in England side. So, to flip it and come here. Like those little things, you don't even think about it. The grocery stores, um, I think the services too, like having to drive to the grocery store, there's not cabs here. The transportation is completely different in England. Um, so you're in the desert, right? Like Nevada, there's not like a train to hop on. There's not cabs. You just like wave down. Like there is in England on every block. There's just cabs wow. waiting for you to take you right like where you're going. So yeah, I think well, those if, little tiny things totally add up. If you go to London, it's like, you know, oh my goodness, I just missed my train. I'm going to be late for work. Oh, well, never mind. There's one one minute behind. You can actually see and it come through the tunnel while the other one's leaving. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the public services, you know, or transportation is absolutely amazing. The buses come every five minutes. So, you know, that's incredible. Whereas yeah. here, it's like, I remember having to get a bus and go to work. And my goodness, you miss that bus, you're late a couple of minutes and that bus is gone. You're screwed. It's going to take another 30 minutes to an hour to get mm. a bus. And by that time, your boss is screaming at you because <laughs> you're late. Yeah. And then, back then, we didn't have Uber when I when I first came over. There was no Lyft. So you call in the yellow cab company or the taxis. And I'll tell you, about out of 100%, 45% wouldn't show up. So you have to keep calling and calling mm. and calling. And that would make me late as well. And it was a nightmare. So mm. public transport, in, and this is in California, trouble public transport in Orange County is terrible. Mm. And for me, coming from London, where it's just so convenient, that was a huge game changer. Mm. Now mm. you got you got to be on point with everything because otherwise you're behind. I didn't yeah. I didn't move obviously to a different country, but I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And like living in, you know, anywhere close to Boston, it's kind of like England, or at least it sounds like it, you know, right. New England, obviously. And so we have public transportation, we have buses and trains coming every five seconds. I mean, literally, people don't even drive really in Boston because there's so much public transportation. You really can't own a car. It's kind of hard to own a car in Boston. And so, you know, all that stuff was what I was accustomed to as well. And then moving up to the desert, it is a completely different world out here. And even though it wasn't a different country, it just, it took so much adjusting to, you know, figure out how to live in this completely different space. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. So you, you get here, you're in California, you're learning the lay of the land. I'm sure, I'm sure West coasters are very different than anyone I met in London, by the way. I, I know a few people from, anywhere, from London, right? so I'm just going to go ahead and guess and let you elaborate oh. on that if you would like. <laughs> no, I really have to elaborate on that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's so different. So yeah. different. Um, don't get me wrong. I had an amazing time. When I come here, I was out, I was meeting people all the time, and it was a buzz, you know, because you're brand new. This is it's fresh. So, um, you know, I went out and met a lot of people. But what the difference between, you know, people in California, not everyone, of course, but the difference between people in California and people in England, you know where you stand in England. <clears throat> There's no hidden agenda behind anything. There's no fakeness. It's like if people like you, they like you. And if yep. they don't, they won't even give you the time of day. That's Where New England. Kind of sounds too. like an East Coaster thing. That's an East too, yeah? Coast thing, right. too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I remember, you know, I went out and made a ton of friends. You know, I was going to the different bars and stuff. And I made, I made some great friends. But then some of my friends were warning me, like, hey, be careful with this guy because he's been talking crap behind your back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
who? And they'll tell me so and so. And I'm like, what? The guy just bought me a beer <laughs> the other day. And he was being like my best friend. But then he's talking smack behind me back. Mm. And I don't know. I don't know. I've never experienced that before. Mm. You know, like, I mean, I understand if it's people who don't actually like you and they want to talk crap. But for somebody to pretend to be your friend and do that, yeah. that was like weird. And yeah. that was so new to me, you know. So, but then you have to be very, very careful and selective with the people you socialize with and hang out with. Yep. So, you know what yeah. I want to talk about? Because the number one thing that I think culturally different between England and a funny side story because I have family from England, uh, the food, like when, when my little brothers or my, my Josh's little brothers came here, they were like, I don't know if I want a corn tortilla or a flour tortilla with my tacos. Like, I don't like the food is so different and going into California. It's a lot of like what I would call Mexi Cali food, which is very, very not traditional in England. So how was that for you? Like, what was the food culture like? So, yeah, um, I miss the food. People always people in America would always tell me, oh, the food in England's bland. It's bland. And I'm thinking, where are you guys going? <laughs> and it's the food we had was amazing. Like, as an example, if you get a super sized Walmart, you've got a food section, clothing, electronics, outdoors, kids section, right? But when you go in England, that super sized Walmart is all food. And then upstairs is the electronics, the clothing, and all that stuff. So it's like there is a huge, huge variety of food. Then the game changer in the way you eat, you've got to be on your guard with what you eat here because the food quality is a whole different story. Tons of sodium in your food. Chemicals, like you could get two of the same brands of food, one from England, one from America. The ingredients is like this much in England, the ingredients that much in America because of all the chemicals they put in. It's like, wow, what are they doing? Yeah. And, this, and, then, and then, you know, you hear people talking about, well, you know, they're trying to keep get people sick and stuff because you've got to pay for the medical where in England they don't want that because medical is free. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got the NHS where here you've got to have insurance and every time you go to the doctor, there's a bill and then they won't give you a result at this one place because they want you to go and get it from another place when they have the results just so you pay more money. And it's ridiculous. So um, when it comes to food, you know, it's like I had to be on my guard. Now I read everything, all mm. the ingredients in the back, just to make sure I know exactly what I'm eating. I do. So, I, read, I read ingredients yeah. on everything. And it's so funny you write about the, the like, Mexicali food. Like, same thing with New England. I don't think I, I don't think I really ever went to, like, a taco place or – you know, any, any sort of food like that. We just don't have them. I mean, we have seafood like on every corner, but we don't have tacos. I get here and everybody's like, I can't live without tacos. And I'm like, that's a thing. Oh, yeah. People love it. They love the- <laughs> it. Right, so actually I completely sidetracked from the question you had asked me. Mm-hmm. So in England, in comparison, we have Indian restaurants everywhere. So yeah. the Mexican food and over there is the Indian food. So yeah. there's the difference, you know? And so when I first come here, I did not like Mexican food at all. <laughs> the rice, the meat, I was like, there's, I just didn't enjoy it. So it took a long time for me to actually start even liking tacos, really. Now yeah. I love tacos and I can eat wet burritos or whatnot, but is Mexican food my absolute go-to? No. Yeah, but I still I still either. enjoy some good traditional, you know, hole in the wall Mexican food that's as close as you can get it to to Mexico. You know, that yeah. is what I really love—the authenticity mm. of the food, not the American Mexican. I don't enjoy that at all. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I think um, the first time I was in a gas station in England, I don't know if people—I definitely didn't realize at the time that the candies that's were different. Very- Oh, petrol garage. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. Yep. That was confusing too. It's crazy how uh, we both speak English. The English is very, very different. In case anyone's curious, I'm sitting in a shop asking for a sweater, and they're like, "What's a sweater?" And I'm like, "Oh, the jumper, rompers, romper sweater. I don't know, whatever it's called here." A uh, jumper. Yeah, <laughs> a jump jumper. Up. Yep. And so I walk into a petrol station. 
all the candy store brands. There's not Kit Kats. There's not, you know, whatever. And you're, you're like, I don't, you know, you obviously want to like load up on trying all these different candy and like those kinds of experiences. So I think not to go too far down the rabbit hole of all the differences, I guess we can just kind of say there are a lot of cultural differences, even though I think if you guessed, you wouldn't think so. So your day-to-day definitely changes, your food habits change, like transportation changes, the way you get to work, what you do when you wake up, because I'm sure the difference between waking up and jumping on a bus versus like getting in your car and getting to drive looks different every morning. So you're out, you're meeting people. I feel like the social life is much different in England as well, but we won't go too much yeah. into that. But uh, yeah, so so you're starting to build a business a business network, and what does that look like, or how are you starting to get some of your first jobs? Actually, the first job, you know, back in England, uh, I was doing electrical work for nine, ten years, and I had an apprenticeship as an electrician. And then I got offered um, an apprenticeship to become a criminal lawyer because my uncle worked for the top lawyers company in London. But they wanted to pay me, like I think it was like just over £14,000 a year. And I was already at that time making like £37,000. And I was like, there's no way I could take a cut like that. Yeah. So I passed that on. You know, I was like, I don't want it. Um, so I stuck to electrical. But then when I come to America... In the beginning, I was trying to set up this little business repairing appliances because I thought, oh, maybe there might be a little bit of a niche in it. So the money I had in my savings back in England, I started dumping it into uh, marketing and I was doing my own posts on Craigslist back then when it was all free. And I was making like all these coded. I don't even know how I've done it, like thinking back, but there was all this coding. And then all of a sudden you've got this advertisement on Craigslist. So I figured all that out and I started getting accumulating work and stuff that way, but it just wasn't good enough because it weren't a great business to be in, mm. you know, because this is a throwaway world. When people, you know, things go wrong, they throw away, they buy a new one. So obviously there weren't enough money in that. And then, um, you know, I was obviously I was with an American girl in the beginning. When me and her broke up, I... I wasn't working at the time. That business that I was trying to work on wasn't going anywhere. It was terrible. And so I was out of work and I was out of a car. And in fact, I was out of everything. She cleaned up my account. I literally had no money in the bank. I went to Ralph's grocery store, went to purchase some food and my card declined. And I'm like, what the heck? I knew I had money. So when I called the bank, they was like, we're sorry, sir, um, but there's been a transfer into you know my ex's account and then there was a hundred bucks she le- must have left in my account that was floating <laughs> hadn't actually gone into her account yet he said i no. can put that into your account which he did so i had a hundred bucks and i had nothing else no car no nothing wow. mm. so now i'm on the floor and i've got to start all over again and mm. the money that i had was obviously gone so um, that was rough that was like rock bottom. And at that point, I was thinking, I think I'm going to have to go back to England. Because mm. I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yep. And I remember one time I was in the car with my buddy and there was a moving company truck pulled up and the guys were looking in. And I said hello to him. And I was like, hello, mate. And I was like, hey, where are you from? <laughs> yeah, and then we as we do. We traffic light. <laughs> and I was like, dude, have you got any work? And I was like, oh, call this number. So I write down a number. Called the guy initially, there was no work. And then um, I was almost at a point where I was going to come home. It was like a week and I was going to jump on a flight and go back to England. And I called that company up again. I was like, hey, man, I called you a while back. Do you have any work? He went, yeah, you can start on whatever day it was. And on that day, it was a make or break. I'm either going to stay here and try and make it or I'm going to break away from America and go back to England. And I was Mm. sitting there. I had a rental car, and I'm sitting outside this place where all these guys are meeting up. And I'm thinking, a moving company. Like, I'm I'm a a skilled tradesman back in England. What am I doing working for a bloody moving company? But Mm. at the same time, you've got to do whatever it takes to make that money and pay them bills. There's no excuses. You've got to just do something. Yeah. So... I was so hesitant. I'm sitting there. I'm like looking at these guys sitting. I'm like, 
what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I was like, so torn. And I was like, screw it. Let me just try. And if it don't work out, I'm going back home. Well, it worked out. So I was with these guys for about just under a year. And it was hard graft, back breaking work, 12 to 14 hours a day for a hundred dollars a day. Sometimes the boss would throw, give us an extra 10, $20 as a tip. And we would get a few tips of people that we had to split around, like around a few guys. So it was rough. It was hard. Anyway, one of my buddies had started working for a plumbing company. And um, he had, I told him, I was like, have a word with your boss to see if he's like taking on anyone else. And he was a brand new business at the time. So he only had, he just got his second van. And that's when my buddy started working for him. So really he had enough guys. He was, the owner, and then the first guy started working for him, and then my friend started working for him as a helper, and he was going to train him up. But then he needed electrical work done. So he asked me to come mm. on board and help him out with the electrical work, which I did. But then the electrical work ran out. So he said to me, how do you feel about you know me training you in the plumbing? Because you'd already seen the way I work. I said, I'd love to learn. He said, no, no worries, I'm going to train you. Mm. And he did. And I was with that company for a little while, for quite a while. And that's when I really, when it comes to like hands-on stuff, like plumbing, electrical, or building something or figuring something out, like I'm pretty sharp when it comes to like that kind of stuff. And so it took me, I would say after about two months, I was working alone. And I'd have to call him up like... You know, I've got this issue, that issue, what I'm doing, and he was talking me through it. And that's where I really started learning and enjoying the plumbing. Mm. And I also saw the money that he was making from this. And I'm thinking, my goodness, like I could be making that money one of these days. So I really need to learn. So I did. I mean, I learned everything I needed and to know. And so I did. <laughs> comeback <laughs> story. We love a comeback story. Yeah. We're going to ask him. He's like, and so I did. <laughs> Right, right. Love it. That's awesome. Okay, so you work for this guy for a little bit. Melissa, do you have any questions, Melissa? You want to add in? No, I think I, I I really like the part of the story where, you know, you're at that point where, like you said, you're days away from going home to England and you, you could throw in the towel or you could just do it. Just do what you got to do and make it happen. And I feel yeah, like, no. you know, that's, that, that could be possibly the difference between someone who has that entrepreneurial spirit and someone who is like, man, eh, I guess I'll just do, you know, whatever comes along. I'll like, go back to a nine to five. Right. Let me just hang out. Initiative to keep pushing yeah. through no matter what. Like that's, you know, it's, it's the bad. point of the matter is don't give up. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah. give up when there's something that you've been wanting to do or you have a dream about something. <laughs> You can't give up because the moment you give up, it's done. You throw it all the way. Then you're going to look back and have a regret. And we don't want to have regrets. So, you know, you can't give up on your dream because you're going to look back and you're going to start regretting your those choices. So now when I look back, yeah, it was a terrible job. And it was like slave labor. And I weren't making anything, really. And not just that, but I had a terrible relationship. I literally got jacked. All my money was gone. The cars were gone. I had nothing. Yeah. So, and then I'm then I'm catching the bus, and then you start thinking of all the convenience that I had back in England. But then, but at the same time, it's like your mind's playing games. Why did you leave England? You left England for a reason, mm-hmm. and you come to America to live this beautiful life that you envision, right? And so. Obviously, being here 11 years later, I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. So I'm so glad for that choice. When I was sitting in that rental car that I was renting, looking at these guys doing whatever they was doing in these these moving trucks and being torn, I'm so glad I made that right choice to follow what it was that I was after for years since I was a little boy. Yeah. To be in America and to make it happen, to have a new life. And it's exactly what I did. I don't want to make it too woo woo or higher power or whatever people say. But like, I feel like when you just make the choice and you put it out there, like something's going to happen to you. Like you put the energy out, you got heard, like however people process that. I think that making that choice 
someone put their hand on top of you, right? And was like, okay, well, you chose. So now it's going to happen for you. And I think people really underestimate that because that's the scariest moment, right? You're like, I might spend the last hundred dollars I have on gas to do this endeavor or rental car or whatever it was, or I'm going to figure out how to make this work as quickly as possible. And it's crazy how often it works out in that moment when you actually decide to choose and bet on yourself. Yep. It really, really does. And let me tell an experience I had. So back in up, back in England, when I was visioning being in America and living in America, which was my dream, um, I would go and tell all my friends and they'd be like, no, you're never going to make it. You're never going to get there. It's impossible. You're not going to make it. And I, every single day, I swear, it was like the law of attraction. You know, I was so positive that, no, I will make it and I'm going to make it. I don't care what anybody says. You can try and sidetrack me. You can tell me whatever it is. But I'm going to be in America every single day. I'll tell my friends I'm moving to America. I'm moving to America. And they're like, no, no. And then what happened? It was probably from the time I started telling them, it was a few years later. And where was I? I was in America. Hmm. And what are they doing? Nothing. They've got mm. nothing going on in their lives. They're, they're doing the same old, same old while I'm here loving life. And yeah. it was just because I was so positive and determined that I will make it into America. One way or another, it's going to happen. And it did. I love yeah. it. <laughs> and here I am. So they're not, they're not a boat. I was going to say, speaking of here I am, you going to talk about where you are and how you got there? <laughs> Yep. Where yeah. you at? What you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm on Lake Mead Marina and uh, I'm on my yacht and I love it. Besides it being a big project that I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Um, what better place could I think about being considering that I've never had this type of lifestyle ever before mm. and absolutely loving it. And although this boat's been a project boat and I've still got a lot of work to do, uh, I'm absolutely loving every minute of it. This is like being a fantastic project and it's been a challenge as well, for sure. But I mean, shall we get into like how I actually got this thing? Yes. Yes. But I want to jump in before that. Let's talk about real. So Inspirize, our platform is about real world wealth. And what that means is like, you didn't go work for this plumber for 10 years. And he's like, you know what? I think I'm sick and I have no family and you're going to inherit my $10 million a year business. And now you're like, yeah, I'm just sitting on a yacht. Like it didn't happen like that. Those kinds of things don't actually really happen to people. It's a lot of work. You're on a grind. You're still continuously figuring out how to put money into the right places in order to build yourself up. People might look at it and be like, oh, well, he got this job and now all of a sudden he's a millionaire, right? You're like, that's not real life. You're like, it's Uh, fucking hard work every single day. And I'm still trying to figure out how I can move up, what I can do next. Like those, those kinds of life lessons for people that are like, yeah, he got the job. Now he's like, whatever, right? No, that's not how it works. We're still hustling. We're still grinding. Like it's, it's the, we're still moving. We're still trying to figure it out. Continuous growth, all things. Those are things that we love. So yes, okay, now you can get into like what happened from these yeah. jobs to where you're sitting now. It's so true what you're saying. And sometimes, you know, you can look at another person and be like, my goodness, they've got it made. They've got loads of money. And, you know, you start thinking, oh, look at them. They've got an easy life and da 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 And really, the backstory, you never know. You just never look know. at what you see. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so talking about grinding, you know, obviously when I started learning the plumbing, for me, that was like a, a great start to my career because it was something that I really enjoyed. And when I was working for that or getting trained up by that one plumbing company, they wasn't paying me a, a lot of money. In fact, I was only making $10 an hour. Wow. And I was like an asset to the company because I didn't just know plumbing. Like at that, at that point, I could do drywall, plastering, concrete repairs and all sorts of stuff which is what we had to do because we'd cut open walls. So to make some extra money, we had to patch the walls. Or some plumbing companies will just tell them they need to get a drywall guy to come in and do that. But this guy wanted to make all the profit. So he had me do that. And then 
there would be times we had to dig up the ground because we had to run pipes in the ground or fix pipes in the ground, which is underneath the concrete. So we had to break it open, then patch it all up and stuff like that. We've done dry, uh, driveways and all sorts of things. And I was training the guys to do all these things. And he was paying me the same amount of money as everybody else, which was absolutely ridiculous. So I remember we went to this, this little bar. It was like a local and um, in Newport Beach. And I sat there and I said to him, I was like, mate, I need a pay rise because, you know, I work really hard. I'm training all these guys. I've overtook, like, most of the guys, because at that time he had more employees. I've overtook all the guys apart from one. We was on the same level with our knowledge in plumbing. And I'm still making $10 an hour, the same as all these other guys that have no idea to do a thing. So I went, all right, let me tell you something. Don't tell no one. I'll give you an extra dollar an hour. So now I'm on $11 an hour. And I'm like, this is a joke. It's a joke. I'm like, I can't okay. believe it. What a tight person. So after that, it was like, you know what? I'm done. Um, you know, that was the end of that job. And I was out of work for a couple of weeks. And I was calling around all these different plumbers. Keeping in mind, I'd only been doing this for about six months with that company. So I'm still relatively new. Yeah, no. But I'm a quick learner. So I went to all these different plumbing companies. I, had, I never wrote um, a resume. You know, everyone wanted a resume. And I plainly told them, I do not believe in a resume. Mm. Because I believe in myself and I know what I can do. And you can put me to the test and try me out. And if you don't like it, get rid of me. But because I was so confident in what I was doing, I knew that wouldn't be the case. So I would email these people and then they kept asking me, like, we need your resume. And I would tell them, I don't believe in resumes, you know, like, give me an interview and I'll prove to you what I can do. And so I feel like, you know, because I had that confidence that shined through for these people where I got every single interview I was asking for from all the companies I applied for. Mm. And so they was all super happy during the interviews and stuff. I told him to put me to the test. I sat there. They'd be throwing out all these trick questions and random questions. And I answered every single one of them 100% accurately. And they were impressed. And then, you know, but at that time, you if someone offers you a job right there and then, you're going to take it. Especially when it was like the money I was asking for. So I went from $11 an hour. I walked into this company. The last interview I had out of all these other interviews that I had. And everyone was like, oh, we'll get back to you, you know. We like what we hear, blah, 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 blah. But this one company were like, when can you start? And I went from $11 an hour to $25 an hour, straight off the bat like that. Yeah. And I was like, I can start Monday. And it was a Friday. They went, okay, you got the job. Great. After that, who was calling me? All these companies were calling me, you know, you're like the perfect fit for our company. You're knowledgeable. You know what you're doing. We want you on board. I'm like, I'm sorry. I've already got a job. And I was like, oh, well, if it don't work out, give us a call. Well, I didn't need to. So I stayed with this company for a couple of years and, and really trained up a lot. Anyway, long story short, it got to a point in time. I made this company alone 500 grand in one year. And I'm looking at those numbers and I'm thinking to myself, bloody hell, I could make that for myself. What am I doing? I need to go off and I need to do this alone and start my own little gig. So that's exactly what I've done. So I handed in my two weeks notice and I remember I was going to go and cash out a check. And as I was going to the bank, my boss walked out. <laughs> and he was, like, <laughs> he was like, Dan, I really need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. He goes, yeah. like, why are you leaving us? And I was like, well, you know, I'll just, I want to go and do something different, something new. And then he was trying to get me to stay. He goes, you know, I've worked hard in this company of building it up. You know, he's like, he told me, and not to be big headed or anything, but he himself said, you're our best plumber. You get the most work. You pull in the most work. You make the most money out of everyone in the company. You don't get no callbacks, you know, and a callback is like someone makes a mistake and they've got an issue. Well, because I'm a perfectionist, I never had callbacks. And then so when these other guys that are working, these other plumbers that are doing the jobs and they get a callback, they'll send me because they knew for a fact I wouldn't get it wrong. 
I'm not saying I'm perfect and all because we all make mistakes. You right. know, and I've made a couple along the way, but and but nothing major. But every time I went back to these customers, they never wanted the other guys back. They only wanted me. So these guys are sitting in the office with no work, and I'm out buzzing, working all day, every day, making good money. And so, but anyway, he wanted to grow the company with me and had me in charge of a certain um, part of the business. But my vision was, well, why do I want to keep working for the man and making him a ton of money when that could be me? So that's when I decided to leave. And I went and bought my own van. I went and started buying my own tools. And it wasn't easy. I didn't have the money to go and buy all the tools that I really needed. So the way I'd done it, I needed a van. That was for sure. I got a logo. I come up with my business name. And then I got a logo. And and it wasn't even actually plumbing in the start. It was 24-hour plumbing or 24-7 plumbing. Hmm. That was what it was in the beginning. And But later, I was like, well, I wanted my name to be involved because yeah. it's personal and like a, you know, it's a family name. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. And that's why I've got Attridge Plumbing now. Um, but anyway, so... Then my buddy, I told him in the beginning, I'll give you 20% to do, if you advertise for me on Craigslist, start pulling in customers, I'll give you 20% of what I make on every job. And then on the bigger jobs, you can come and help me and I'll pay you X amount of money, whatever it was. So he done that for me for about a year and a half. In the beginning on Craigslist, it was really cheap. People didn't want to pay the money. So I was like charging like, not that much, but I was still making way more money than what I was working for the company. I'm making $25 an hour. Now I was making $90 an hour, even though the going rate then was $110 an hour for plumbers. So I, I think I started about $80 and then crept up to like 85 and then 90. Mm. And then, then I started getting referrals. And when I started getting referrals, then it was full price. Because these people already had trusted me because it was referred from a friend or a family member. So now I could charge full price. And that's how I started growing and started making more money and more money. And then my buddy who's doing the advertising, he found another job doing what he does. And uh, I was on my own. But by that time, I'd already had this clientele. So I didn't need to advertise anymore. And everything was word of mouth. And the rest is history. <laughs> and I'm still history. doing the same thing. Yeah, and loving it. I love it. I feel like there's a lot of um, wins within that. Melissa, you want to go? So, so you you just keep hustling. You just keep moving. You keep growing. And I think that's a big part, too, is that you know, you can, you can get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing what I need to do. But if you don't grow at the same time, you know, you could, you could get to where you need to go and then you could it very easily become stagnant. So constantly, you know, moving forward and growing. And so, you know, kind of to get into your next story, um, when you're at the point where, you know, you, you have this business and it's, and it's growing and it's moving and you're doing well, I feel like that then opens up uh, room and space in your life for hobbies. And so is that when the boat came into play? So tell us the story on that. I mean, I feel like I've got to tell you a little bit more before I get into that because it wasn't always rosy and it wasn't always smooth. You know, sometimes you can make bad choices in business. And when you make a bad choice, it affects the company like massively. And so I had this vision. People ask me, oh, can you do bathroom remodels? Can you do the tile and all this stuff? Which I was like, well, actually, I can. So what I thought, well, maybe I can get a crew of guys to do the bathroom remodels. Then I can pinch a bit of money from that and continue doing the plumbing. So I would take on these jobs. But what happened was is that I couldn't find the right guys. So I'm the one stuck on these bathroom remodels, mm. which wasn't a ton of money. And I'm not a tile. I'm a, I can tile just like a tiler, but it's not something I was doing every day. So I was very slow. But then my plumbing customers would call me. I couldn't get to them because I'm stuck on these tile jobs and these bathroom remodels. 
and I started losing my customers left and right, and it was bad. It declined so dramatically to mm. the point my phone wasn't even ringing anymore. Mm. And then it was scary because my phone was blowing up. I was taking, I was, I was taking four or five jobs a day, but my phone, I was getting more than that, and I had to turn them down because I couldn't keep up with it. To nothing. And it was this bathroom remodel, that bathroom remodel. So I really suffered a lot to the point where I literally had nothing again in the business. And at that time is when I changed the name to Hatchery Plumbing. And I restarted it all over again and uh, started handing out business cards from door to door. Because it was like I, my buddy wasn't doing the advertising anymore. And Craigslist had changed quite a lot from how it used to be. So I was door to door on my own, handed out business cards. And then I started getting phone calls again, one after the other. And it started growing it and growing and growing. So then that's when I could start enjoying things mm. like having these hobbies. Um, I purchased some, actually I was on, I was on a job and one of my customers had these jet skis and I purchased the jet skis from this customer. I had they gave me three of them for a very reasonable price with a trailer. And from that moment on, I was like, I was always looking. I, I love to find deals. I just do. I love finding deals. And I bought these three jet skis and a trailer for like twelve hundred bucks, which was super cheap. And when I oh. done a Kenny Blue Book, just for the two and the trailer was like thirteen grand, <laughs> and I had another one left over. So I remember one time, you know, I'd go out in Newport Beach from the harbour to Catalina on my jet ski all the time. I absolutely loved it. And then one day, awesome. I invited my buddy and his girlfriend to come over. I said, but I've got to do some electrical work on one of the jet skis because it wasn't running. So I got that all fixed up. And then we both went over to Catalina Island. Anyway, long story short, it was a bit of an issue with my buddy and his girlfriend. And she was just a hater. And I really believe to this day she threw away my key to my jet ski and she booked a ticket on the ferry straight off the bat and went to Newport Beach. And I'm left behind with one jet ski that I just rebuilt so I didn't have full confidence or trust in and no key to my main one that I love. And it was I had to tow it all the way across the channel from Catalina wow. to Newport wow. Beach. That was like a, thir a 29, 30 mile journey. Wow. And I'm cruising. And at one point in time, about halfway, the engine died. And I'm oh. like, you got to be kidding me. Oh, God. And not just that, that's where the big, huge ships, the cargo ships are passing through. You imagine facing one of them? You're done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm like, my goodness, this is an absolute nightmare. Oh, no. And, uh, Anyway, I was like, I need to get a boat. I need to get a boat. If I had a boat, we'd all be in the boat. We could stay on the boat. We could cook on the boat, sleep and shower and everything. And we ain't got to worry about these tides getting choppy because we could still cruise back. We wouldn't be stuck because the jet skis are small vessels. You can't go out when it's super choppy. Not when you're in 16 miles offshore in the middle of the ocean. Like, it gets dangerous. So, I... Thank goodness the jet ski started back up. It took me a couple of hours to get back. And wow. after that, I was like, I'm done. And that is when I was looking for boats and found this boat, which is my first ever boat. And it's the 33-foot carver. It's a cruiser, uh, two stories. And it's dated. it was dated when I bought it. And I was sitting there thinking, I could remodel this and make this thing look amazing not knowing what I was getting myself into. So I part exchanged two jet skis and a trailer and a thousand bucks for the boat. Wow. Wow. And then I had one more jet ski left over. Keeping in mind, I only paid $1,200 for all three of them on the trailer anyway. Yeah. But the value of the jet skis were actually more than what this boat value was at the time. Wow. So um, the one jet ski, I had to rebuild it. Never done it before, but I bought new pistons. I bought out the inside of the uh, the bores up where the pistons go, make the engine run. <laughs> and that's kind of technical stuff now, but um, I fixed it up and I sold that for $3,800. So I got all my money back yeah. and more. And a boat. And a boat. <laughs> and a boat. And I got the boat out. That's like a good deal to me. Entrepreneurial. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so this has been my work in progress and it's been my project and I absolutely love it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get this boat absolutely completely remodeled to the max and I'm decking it out and I want it to be the best of the best so I can, once I finish, sell it, get as much money out of it as I can possible, which I'll get all my money back plus more. And then I'm going to get the sailboat that I've been wanting for the longest time. Yeah. I love it. I feel like just moving and progressing and like just trying to figure out how to grow, right? Like just a lot of growth. What's the next step? What's the next thing? But I think the underlining way that you're doing that is you could easily say, I'm going to go work nine to five for $40,000 the rest of my life. And when I'm 70 years old, maybe I'll be healthy enough to buy a sailboat, you know, like yeah. you are still doing what you want to do through your passion. Like you're like, I have my hobbies and I still have my, my, like, um, my friends and my travel time. And like, I'm able to have this life that I really want and my business and I'm working for myself and time freedom, um, and being able to pick up as many jobs as you want, because I do think that there's a point in time where, you know, we're working for the man and we're like, we could make more money. And then you make a lot of money and you're like, Oh, the goal isn't actually that I wanted to make this much money because there's a certain time frame where you're like working 80 hours a week for yourself is cool and all and making a shit ton of money is cool and all but there is a balance to that once you have it and then you have this kind of freedom to really follow your passion and I feel like that's the sweet spot in like the entrepreneurial life that yeah. people people think it's like some kind of progressive journey where you're like up here making all this money but there's a lot of really sweet spots between here and there that people like to hang out and I think that you doing that in a way that you're passionate about and like still like having hobbies and stuff is awesome because I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they go into the world and they're like, I'm just going to work 80 hours a week for myself for the rest of my life. And they actually forget why they started. Right. And of course, you know, we've all got different personalities, right? So, you know, you, you can set yourself a goal and, you know, it depends on how much freedom you actually want. You can go and work really hard so many days a week and then have the rest off as what you want, like your freedom to do whatever it is you like to do. So for me, I was working really hard, but if I wanted a break or take some time off, I would, but I love working. And for me, it was like that. The work is what gives me the freedom to go out and enjoy it and be happy and do the things that I love to do without having to worry about, losing my job working for the man you know mm -hmm. it's like I can make my own schedule my own time you can take work what take whatever you want to take take as much as you want to take um and you can you can make that balance you, do you see what I mean you, you can make yeah. your own balance in life with everything yeah. when you work for yourself but when you're working for the man it's uh it's a nine till five or eight till four, whatever it is you're doing. 24 seven grind because yeah, you're, you're they're worried grinding. about you making the money. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, I don't care who it is. Everyone can do what they love if they put their mind to it and don't give Agreed. up. Agreed. You can't, the key is to never give up. You've got to keep trying, keep grinding until you get to that point. And is it always going to be smooth and rosy? No. You're going to have your challenges. You're going to have your struggles. You're going to have your pitfalls. You're going to be on the floor. You're going to be in tears. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be hurting sometimes and struggling and thinking that maybe you can't get ahead. But then you've got to switch up that thinking, stay positive, be hopeful and be determined and keep trying. Don't give up till when actually there will be a turning point in your life where things do start falling into place exactly what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that it's, it's never really about the money. People think that, you know, I want to, I want to work. I want to grow. I want to save this money because I want this money. It's never about the actual money in our bank account. We don't strive to have a bunch of zeros. We strive for the feeling and the emotion and the passion that we feel when we spend that money on whatever it is that we want to do or that we want to have or that we want to experience. And so like loving your life in between earning that money 
is also just as important because that's what you're striving for. You're striving for that happiness and that joy and those feelings in between. And so you should have it not just when you accomplish a goal and make money, but like throughout your, your whole life, whether it's personal or, or business wise, just with everything that you're doing. Yeah. yeah and I think um, the in between is also how you avoid burnout. Mm-hmm. You know, for people, you might have high stamina and be able to work all of the time. But if you don't take those breaks and really, truly use those breaks for what you're passionate about or, you know, what you're doing, be passionate about that while you're working 80 hours a week. That's how the burnout happens for sure. Yeah. Have that balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've actually been in a position where Mm -hmm. I was overworking it, overworking it, overworking it ridiculous hours and I got so burnt out I couldn't do a single thing my mind just shut down and I was done but then it's a dangerous place to be because you can start feeling you can fall into depression you can give up you lose your motivation and then trying to pick yourself back up when you're down in that pitfall is so hard and challenging and to change your and to alter your way of thinking is it feels like it's impossible, even though there's nothing really that is impossible. But it feels like it's impossible. And I've been in that posi- in that situation. And I tell you, I never want to be there ever again. So yeah. it is about even when things are not going the way you want it to go. And even when things are not as great as you, you was hoping it to be, you know, you've got to keep that positive attitude. Because the moment you start thinking negative, yeah. negative thoughts, then things start spiraling downhill. And that's not where you want to go. You've yeah. got to stay level-headed at all times. I yeah. truly believe that that's when you're most susceptible to illness of any kind Absolutely. as yeah. well. Yeah, if you're literally sitting in a place of, Melissa has an amazing analogy of like a, a drained battery, right? When you're in that drained battery, your body doesn't have time to fight off illnesses. Your body doesn't have the energy to like create the serotonin to keep your positive thoughts, right? Like all of these things that happen from staying away from burnout. I think, um, I, I really do resonate with like the hustle and grind mentality. I like it. I have a lot of energy, but I know a lot of people cannot stay there. It's very masculine and it will, re- it will hurt you in the long term. So you have to make sure that while you're grinding, you also know your body and you know when you need to relax and what those breaks look like. And it can be kind of a balance thing act on its own that's challenging for people. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Love it. Cool. So ultimately, don't give up. Yeah. yeah. Don't give up. I love it. Stay yeah. in your passion. <laughs> don't give up. Keep thought. going. Keep going. Life's yeah. rigged in your favor. Yeah. It will work out. You just have to keep putting your foot in for- forward. what do you think melissa any closing thoughts i think this is really great daniel thank you so much for sharing your story with us i think that there were a lot of different aspects to it from like moving to the different businesses to the grind the hustle following your passion that a lot of people would really resonate with um melissa i'd love to hear some closing thoughts from you Yeah. So, uh, I feel like what's next for your business is, um, now that you have moved your business from California to Nevada, Mm. you're going to kind of be going through that process over again, building up your clientele, building up your referrals, building up your network. Um, so I know that you have your website at Rich plumbing that's launching soon. And so, uh, and then you have your Facebook page, uh, at Church Plumbing, and so they can uh, find you in the meantime those ways. And so, if you just want to tell people, um, kind of, I mean, I, I guess you, you, you know, plumbing is plumbing, but if you just want to tell people like a little bit about your services and if they uh, want to contact you, what you offer. Absolutely. So, you know, the the niche in the plumbing, the niche I want in plumbing is straight up honesty. I know that. You know, when it comes to plumbing companies, you'll call a plumber, they'll come to the home, you know, you expect it to be one price, and then before they leave, you're paying a, a ton of money. And you're thinking, Flippin' heck, where did this price come from? For us, you know, it's all about transparency. We want to build up the trust in the customers. I want to see happy faces. There, There's no gray areas. I want it to be completely honest, transparent, and I want my customers to be absolutely satisfied. And so this is where I really want to stand out different. 
and eventually, like on the website, on the website, I'm, I want to have all my my price lists so people know exactly what they're paying out the door. There's nothing hidden, you know, unless there's some extras that you know we stumble across because that happens too. But you know, these what like, what I want from my customers is a peace of mind. I want them to have that peace of mind where they know they can trust us. They know they're not going to get ripped off, you know, and they're going to get the best quality products and uh, total satisfaction. Yeah, that's super important. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think good quality is definitely what's going to save someone's longevity and the transparency. I know I've definitely been in positions where you call somebody up and they're like, yeah, you know, we'll show up at your door for $75 and then it's usually about $110 after and then they leave and you get a $700 bill and you're like what right. happened between that right. original 185 or whatever number example I just gave and the right. other 500 or something so I love yep. that that happens a lot and yeah. you know when I've worked for these companies where it's like they tell you you the, you got to charge them X amount, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, like these people are getting robbed. Mm. And the one of the reasons why I left left the first company, which I'm not going to say names because it's not right to do so, but um, the reason why I left that first company is because I hated the lights, the shakiness, mm. the dishonesty. You know, they'll tell you they're going to do whatever it is they're doing, and they only do half a job because you can't see it. So you're mm. thinking, oh, wow, great, we've got this. But they're cutting corners all the time, trying to save a, or trying to pinch the penny. Mm. And for me, I don't like to work that way. It's not the way to work, you know. It's you're expecting to pay for good service. And good service is what good service is, is what we should get. And I want to treat people how I want to be treated. And I'm going to treat their home how I want my own home to be treated. Mm. Yep. Yep. As a marketing person, when I hear people have a high referral rate, it makes me think that they have really quality work because yep. your customer knows three months down the line, if you didn't do the job well, because something goes wrong later, right? right? Or whatever, yep. right? So you don't get a referral a year later. So when I have businesses that call me up and they'll say, you know, I've been in business seven years and I need new, all new customers. I don't have customers. It's like, well, where the hell is your business from the last yeah. seven years? What have you been doing? I know that it's probably not high quality, right? So I think being able to use that and know that for people that are listening that are maybe new or you, you can use that in any business practice, people know if you have good quality or not. Um, yeah, and it will exactly. always come back tenfold to not cut corners now. I think there's like a very high study with Nordstrom's like salespeople. If you tell somebody that they look great in something and that they go to this event and all their friends are like, why are you wearing that? Well, instead of putting them in something that's amazing, you know, and now all their friends want to know where they bought it, they're going to start shopping at Nordstrom's. Those businesses do 10 times better when you come from a place of quality. So if you're listening to this, quality is king yep. in those places, especially because it will come back tenfold on the woo-woo side, right? Like the universe and karma. And we all know when we put out good energy, it's going to come back tenfold. But really in the service industry, it always comes back tenfold. Yeah, yeah exactly. transparency. I, I feel like transparency is huge with service businesses because yeah. it's so easy to, you know, cover up where, where that time is going or what's being worked on or whatnot. So coming from a place of always being honest and always being transparent, I think is super important in business. Yeah. And not just that as well, but, you know, it's like when you're on the job, let's say you encounter something that's going to be extra, explain to the customer, show them so they... You know, so they're on the same page as you. You know, that I feel like it's so important to fill everybody in that's involved on that project so everybody knows where you stand. Yeah, Tra treating people like people just because you're a business doesn't yeah. mean, yes. you know, doesn't yeah. mean that you have to be stiff and rigid. You can still treat people like, like people. We're human. That's it. Yep. yep. Yeah. I love that. Awesome advice. We've all got our flaws. Yeah. <laughs> we try, if you're good, you try and do your best. Yeah. I think I think treating people like people is interesting because when you're in a business to consumer place, I think people um, they forget about being personable versus right. being professional. Sometimes they think it's to like walk in with the collar and look all whatever, right? But you know, it's 
it's great to be like, Hey, you know, like I love your couch or like a small compliment or like introducing yourself, crack a joke. Like, don't forget to literally be a person in those spaces. Yeah. It will make you way more memorable. Um, prior to this conversation, we were talking and I was telling Daniel about something that had happened in my last house that we lived in. And he was like, well, did he show you that? And I was like, did he show me what, that there was an issue in the wall and they charged me like two grand to cut open my sink. Oh, am I frozen? Oh, frozen. Okay. Wait. So I was like, did they show me what, like why they charged me $2,000 to cut a hole in my wall under my sink? No, like they did not show me anything. They just told me that's what I needed. And he was like, I would never do that. Like, this is where you show them. This is like how you walk through. These are the materials I need. You know, I think that transparency would be a completely different situation. I would absolutely refer out that person versus like, man, I hope whatever he just did and charged me two grand for, I really actually needed even because I don't actually know if that's even what I needed or if it, it did fix the issue, but it could have. I've, I've said this before, but I, I think it's a really good thing to remember in any business is people work with people they like. So if you're a likable person, yep, if you're a likable person and you do a good job and you know, you're somebody that they would like in real life, then, you know, you're going to do really well in business because people yeah. work with people they know or people they like. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Love yeah. it guys. Well, thank you, Daniel, so much. I'm going to let you All enjoy right. the windy weather that's happening behind you. I know it, here in Phoenix, it's sunny and 75 and a slight breeze. It looks like it's the same there. It's Melissa. Cooler, but it's beautiful. And I'm yeah. lovely. I love it. What a beautiful. Can't really beat that. Yeah. I feel like it's very British of you to be like, I'm going to live on a boat and I want a sailboat because my, <laughs> I feel like that's a very British dream. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Is it stereotypical or not? Did no one come for me for that? But I feel like <laughs> you can name like a handful of people that are like, I'm going to get me a sailboat. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I'm excited to see your flip. I'm excited to see your, your next uh, toy, your next hobby, your next boat. I'm excited to see you get to your sailboat. I know all those things are coming for you. Just got to keep hustling, keep grinding. In the meantime, let's stay in touch. I will yep. link up. I will link up everybody so they can find you. Um, Daniel is in Vegas and doing work in California, I believe. Still, you're still in California. Yeah, Orange County. Uh, we cover most of Orange County. Uh, based at Liverpool Beach over there. So, you know, that's going to be continuing to go along. And I mean, in the same at the same time with Vegas. So, awesome. you know, I've got guys over there in California, and Nevada is like a new startup for me, which is I'm looking forward to. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not gonna just shut down the business in California. That's going to keep running. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. You know what? I could think of worse places to work than Newport Beach. So I don't blame you. Or Vegas. Or Vegas. Yeah. Or Vegas. Right. <laughs> or Vegas. Oh my goodness. The both well. So yeah. Awesome. Love it. All right, you guys. Right. Well, thanks so much. We will all be in touch soon. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a great day. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.